Thank you, Rick. Well, hello, good morning from, from myself as well. And uh, well, thanks for being here, first of all, because it's, it's nice, bright and early. Uh, and you know, there's a competing talk, so you picked the right one. Um, so this is um, a reflection, uh, basically, on, on the teaching I've done and uh, the teaching that, that Eric has been talking about before that I guess I should reintroduce myself and tell you a little bit more about what I do uh, just now. So name is Gianluca, that's the Italian pronunciation, it's a bit strange with the spelling. Um, and as Eric mentioned, I'm currently a data science at Microsoft in the algorithms and data science uh, solutions team. So I joined them roughly a month and a half ago, it's pretty, pretty new still, uh, early days with them. Uh, I recognize a few faces from yesterday around a workshop on Azure and how to use the Microsoft Cloud uh, services to build a data-driven product. Today I won't be talking to you at all about Microsoft and Azure apart from my top maybe. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is the experience that I've had through teaching. So um, roughly three years ago now, uh, it was August 2015, I decided that it would be nice to teach data science and coding and everything I've been doing up until that point to people and that seemed to be interested uh, in, in this. So this company estimate was, was born and uh, in fact the teaching um, experience that, that I got was mostly uh, not through this company but through Imperial College which is where I did my PhD. It turns out that if you're in academia, especially a research heavy university like Imperial is, um, if you just say well I think I would like to teach you will suddenly have hundreds of hours of teaching on your plate because no one wants to teach. Uh, and um, so through this, I ended up in uh, have a number of master's uh, degrees, teaching in epidemiology, biostatistics, biomedical sciences, uh, medicine, teaching stats to, to future medics, which was quite interesting and, and challenging. And at some point thought, right, what does it look like if you go outside of the, in the realms of traditional universities and, and teach this to people? It's a very different setting, of course. Uh, you have and the main difference, I guess, is that in university you're there to learn, and that's all you do, pretty much full time. Um, whereas people outside normally have to balance family life and work, and, and if they're learning something, then there's, there's that component too. And you enter as a little part, as a little um, hassle in that big mosaic, and you know, hopefully make a difference. So it's been, uh, I've now thought through General Assembly and, and my own company, well, a few hundred people, as, as Eric mentioned as well. So I thought maybe it's time to reflect on this and see whether we're doing it right. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. So we'll go through three main topics. The first one is quite easy. I think I don't really have to convince you too much. That's the skills gap in data science. You've probably heard that we don't have enough people. In my previous company, I did quite a bit of hiring, and certainly this was the case. We spent a good six months trying to hire for data scientists, failed miserably, and then had a second round and we finally managed to find someone. So it's incredibly complicated uh, to find data scientists, which if you are in data science, if you want to train as a data scientist, is good for you uh, because you're in high demand. Then I want to talk to you about the data science potential, which is the promise, if you want, of data science, what data science promises us and what you know, we ought to deliver, I guess at some point, and then finally how we implement all this, which is perhaps a bit too ambitious, but I'll, I'll try. So we'll get started, first of all, with the definition of what data science is, because you, know, you can't really uh, talk about any of this if you don't have a shared understanding of what data science is. And you might have seen this, this is originally from Drew Conway, it's uh, adapted. Uh, but the idea is that data science, or data scientists, uh, lie at the intersection of these three um, domain. So you have computer science, you have maths and statistics, which if you want are the two hard skills of data science. And then down here you have the domain expertise, the subject matter expertise, which traditionally is perhaps what you would associate with data analysts instead. So you have all possible combinations and in the center you have the unicorns of the data scientists. And what I want to convince you of today is that you don't actually need to look for unicorns and you don't need to be a unicorn. So this is well, it's, it's not necessarily a data science definition I completely agree with. So what I think data science is, in, in fact, is slightly different. I like to think of it as data-driven decision-making. And if you are in medicine, this is, this is the same thing as saying evidence-based medicine. The idea is that you want to make decisions. If you are a doctor, you want to treat your patients. If you are in a business, you want to make business decisions that maximize your profits. That's normally the end result for most companies. And you want, rather than just taking random stabs in the dark, you want to do so 
you have, you have some data, that's the starting point, and you believe that there's a better way or there should be a better way of using that data to understand what you ought to be doing, and then do it, measure again, and repeat this process. That, as, as I understand it, is, is data science. So the focus really is on the process that leads you to solving a problem, well, leads you to formulate a problem in the first place. So understanding, of course, that there is a problem is, is the first step. Uh, collecting data, making sure that this process leads to a solution. This is something I stressed uh, quite a bit yesterday. You know, if you don't um, actually put stuff into production, if data science doesn't produce results and those results are not used, then it's kind of useless. And I've got a nice story about this that I'll tell you later. Um, it is true that it lies at the intersection of many things. There's computer science, there's maths, there's statistics, there's the, um, that kind of body of knowledge in both disciplines that has been built up over many years. And of course, you cannot ignore that. There's also many new developments, as you know. It's especially in so-called artificial intelligence and neural networks. Um, things are moving pretty fast. So that's something that needs to be um, taken into account. But of course, it's domain-centric, meaning that you still need to know what the business is about. And that's probably the most important bit, especially if you want to solve a problem. It's not necessarily the techniques. And as someone who is very much on the kind of tech-heavy side of things and Microsoft, I sometimes geek out. That's, that's my confession. Uh, it's nice to play with the, the, the cool tools of, of data science. But at the end of the day, you know, very often solutions are much simpler than, than you think. And delivering value is what really matters, not playing with the cool neural networks. Which is also my last point, that tools are secondary. You, if you've been learning data science on your own or through other courses, you know, there's the big debate, is it Python or is it R, or is it maybe MATLAB, or is it maybe Julia, or why you're not programming in C at that point? Um, which, by the way, I've done in my previous job as part of the data science solutions. Um, so I don't believe that that is really important. I believe that tools are kind of secondary. Uh, you could be doing data science in Excel. I'll probably get some nice comments from this. But, you know, if, if it gets your, um, your work done, then Excel is an excellent tool, and uh, it's quite quick to get things done. If you're just going to do one analysis and the data are already in Excel, then why not? So data science is not the tools. Data science is the process. That's, that's the point. Right. The skills gap, well, I think is best summarized by this sentence. The shortage of data scientists is becoming a serious constraint in some sectors. This comes from a famous Harvard Business Review article. That's the one that described data science as the sexiest job of the 21st century, which you might have read. If you've not, it's a good read because it's from a few years ago and pretty much nothing's changed since then. So it's, it's a good one to go back and reread if you've not uh, read it before as well. So I don't really need to convince you about this. But what I want to talk to you about today is my experience in both of these domains of how do we try and close that skills gap. And traditionally, you have higher education. These are the universities. This is Imperial. Uh, pretty much or, or, or the other. So the traditional degrees, there's lots of theory uh, there. There's a number of data science masters and machine learning masters have been popping up uh, over the last five or so years. They take a while to catch up, of course, because you need cohorts of people to go through the programs and then slowly they start trickling into the job market, which is also interesting when you go and, and are on the hunt for a job and see that people require you, you know, a data science master and 10 years of experience. Like 10 years ago, we didn't have any data science masters. <laughs> This is just impossible. Um, perhaps this will give you more recognition because, of course, as a society, we tend to value higher education, which is probably for the good or for the best. So this is, in some, uh, in some industries particularly, this is perhaps the only way, or it's that filter that will, uh, you'll need to pass or that checkbox that you'll need to tick uh, to be able to even start talking to recruiters. So that's, that's that. And then you have what I like to call upskilling, and this is anything from boot camps, courses. You know, we have Cambridge Spark is one of the, um, of the sponsors of, of Data Science Fest today. And uh, they run their own boot camps. General Assembly, which, as I said, is this where I, I do most of my teaching. Uh, you also have those big online courses from the famous one from Enjung and, uh, and others. So there's a lot of stuff out there, uh, both online and, and offline. A lot of it is hands-on, which is good. There's not a lot of theory. There's a lot of application. Uh, so this kind of goes in, in the direction of what I was telling you, you know, use it. Uh, it also adapts much faster. Uh, I've been in that kind of teaching, and I've been teaching the same stuff for four or five years, because you 
tend not to update things and, and things, you know, that uh, the higher education, uh, education is more or less crystallized or it moves much more slowly. The new neural networks, you can teach quite quickly and you can show people. And I think especially for what I call this upskilling, what you show at the end of the day is not necessarily that you took the course because that doesn't, you know, anyone can, can go on Coursera and just click through and not really understand much. But what you do is you show your skills. So you create something, uh, a project or a side project or some kind of analysis, publish it, GitHub seems to be a popular venue for doing so, and that, uh, that really is your portfolio and that's what you show to, to employees. Of course, this goes both ways, so employers need to be ready to do that, but we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. And the questions then that I asked myself as I was preparing this were, how do you ensure in both cases, because universities you know, are not perfect in, in the teaching that they do, of course, how do you ensure that this is relevant, which means that you get out of uni, you get out of one of those courses, online or offline, and what you learned can actually be applied, and you can actually do something with it. There's also a question of quality and a question of consistency, especially online, you end up finding a lot, a lot of stuff. And if you're just starting, you sometimes don't know what to look for, which is part of the problem, and sometimes you find far too much and it's difficult to filter out what you should uh, and, and should not dig further into. You know. So these were the questions uh, that I wanted to, to ask myself and, and think about. But the actual question is, how do you realize the potential of data science? Which, of course, begs the other question of what is the potential of data science? Because uh, you know, it's, it's very much hyped uh, nowadays. You, well, you hear about artificial intelligence. This, in the first version of this presentation, I called this the AI potential. And then I thought it was too hypey uh, and decided to call it the potential of data science instead. But you, you can understand it as, as both um, if you want. And I think this is, again, there are three components to this. The first one is automation, and this is what scares a lot of people. But in fact, you know, in, in the 30s, it was exactly the same. Rise of the machine makes hide the lens. This was the New York Times, I think, in 1929. So it's pretty much always the same. There's also risk minimization, or the general idea that if you have machines do things, maybe they will be fairer, or they will behave better, they will behave without human biases. And we're finding out that that's not quite the case. And of course, innovation. So you have um, a lot of promise, and a lot of this comes from robotic, the self-driving cars, and all that kind of stuff that's, that's happening or that's advancing almost on a daily basis. So that's what we want. And then we are teaching something. And what I wanted to understand is whether what we're teaching is linked to achieving all of this. That was the idea. And what I believe is that if you want to realize this potential, you need to embed data science in society. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what this, this embedding is. But particularly if you run a company, if you're part of a company which doesn't have data science as their first aim or objective, then it needs to be embedded within the company culture and it needs to be embedded within the company processes. So that's my uh, hypothesis, which I will now try and prove. This means a few things. It means that if you are a company and you're looking for data science, and that many, many companies are looking for data scientists and, and looking to you know, create that data science uh, teams inside. This means that data science is not something you buy. It's not a pre-made package. It's something you build. It's something you customize for your own domain. It's also something you need to cultivate internally. It's not enough to just have and hire data scientists. You need to support them somehow, and we'll talk about how you do this. So you don't just outsource, you can, um, you know, th there are many uh, data science consulting companies and this works, it works fine if you want to build a specific product or you want something done quickly, that works beautifully. But that doesn't really cultivate any internal data science culture, which is what you want. And you also want, at least for now, at least for another few years until artificial intelligence kills us all, you want humans in the loop. So you want people, in fact, uh, to be at the center of the machine learning. They're learning, but they're learning from humans. And what we're trying to do is possibly, in the first stage, replicate what human decision-making looks like. And to do that, you need guidance and you need to know what you're doing. It's easy to apply algorithm. It's less easy to understand what it is that you're doing when you run your scikit-learn uh, ML model or do your analysis in R. So that's, um, that's what this means. But 
there are three components to this. I think the first one I don't particularly like, so I call this numeracy. I, for lack of a better word, really, if you want to suggest one to me, please do. I'll explain to you what I mean by that. The second one is culture. And by this, I mean company culture. You could argue that we probably need more understanding of data science and statistics in general within society. And I would argue that that's definitely the case, especially because if machines are going to take decisions for us and if I apply for a mortgage, it's actually a machine that's going to you know, give me the money or not, then I probably need to understand how that works. And I need to understand the implications of this. But this is a societal concern, which I'm not going to talk about today. And the last one is adoption, which basically means you need to use it. So, Numeracy, I really like this uh, XKCD, and if you don't know what XKCD is, <laughs> please go there and procrastinate, because it's beautiful. Um, this is from 2014, so it's not even five years old, and it's fantastic. This is about computer science, you know, someone wanting to build a system to check whether photos uh, are taken inside a national park, which would be an easy GPS lookup, and then in check whether the photos of a bird are need a research team and five years. This is now, you can do this on, even though your laptop, that'll take a while to, to train, but you can do that with neural networks in you know, not very long. And as I said, this was uh, four years ago, roughly, which is beautiful and interesting. So by numeracy, I mean a couple of things. You need to realize what's possible, and this is moving very quickly, which means that you kind of need to keep abreast of, of the change. And if you are at the top of the company, and you are the one making decisions, then it might be quite complicated to understand what the people who understand more of the tech are doing and, and realize what it is possible and what they can do. It also means that you need to understand what capacity you have, and this is linked to uh, my, uh, my next slide. And finally, you need to understand how this whole thing happens. So this will, we'll see as well. So when I talk about capacity, I really like this uh, pyramid, which is called the AI um, hierarchy of needs from Monica Rogatti. And uh, she believes, and I believe as well, that you know, there's a lot of companies, and I've had people asking me to create a deep learning model on 40 observations, which is laughable. So you don't start here. Where you need to start if your company doesn't do any data is by collecting it. You can't have a data scientist work on nothing. And you know, there's, there's a lot of step, and, and these are some, of, some examples of this. But uh, you need data, of course. You need data that's clean, that's collected, that's consistently collected. Once that's there, you can start thinking about it. But the first thing you should think about is probably not the neural network up there. You should probably think about some simple analytics on that and see whether there's something else that you ought to be collecting and are not collecting, uh, or if there's anything strange in the data. After that, you might start thinking of maybe some traditional stats, maybe some modeling, maybe some machine learning, but certainly not start with a deep neural network. So that's, that's the point. That's, I guess, the first thing. And many uh, companies are just rushing to find data scientists. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, if you are a data scientist and you are in that position, it's quite miserable. So you're kind of the trophy data scientist, and uh, there's nothing for you to do. And it kind of goes both ways. It's frustrating for the data science team because there's nothing to do. It's frustrating for the management because they see the data scientists doing nothing. So it's, it's, there's no winning in, in this situation. Second one, uh, which I think is now part of the culture that the company everywhere needs to understand and, and embed, that's the embedding, is that we predict a lot of stuff in data science. But the return on investment of data science projects, I argue, is possibly the most difficult thing to predict. You start doing something, you start looking at some data, perhaps because you have a kind of lazy afternoon and you have nothing to do, and you find something that looks interesting, you go down the rabbit hole and you maybe find something that actually is interesting and can, can make a difference, or maybe not, you don't know. So I argue that this looks like a power law, so you have that kind of Pareto thing where most projects go nowhere, and you know, you spend time and is this kind of exploratory or, or research, if you want to call it that. Research is very similar. So the return on investment is not easy to predict and its distribution is very skewed. You might hit the jackpot and create, you know, the next Facebook uh, or, or something of the like, or it might just fail. And this is something that you need to understand and it's something you need to, in a sense, live with. So failure is always an option in a lot of these projects. And there's another way of thinking about this, which is not 
planning is not, and, and this comes from some software engineering now, if you might have heard of uh, agile methodologies. The way of dealing with this is not by careful planning, because your plans are going to be screwed anyway. The way to do this is to embrace a kind of agile culture where you understand that this is the case, you iterate quickly, you do things as quickly as possible in short sprints. The way we do this in Microsoft is in sprints of normally two weeks. So every two weeks we kind of look back, decide what worked, decide what didn't work, and fail because this is going to happen. Some, some things are not going to go anywhere. But once you know that this is the case, you can then refocus and you can continue working on what's promising and you can just remove uh, everything else. And this allows you to focus and to quickly get to something. It also takes uh, a bit of courage, I think, to be able to you know, kill projects and understand where something that perhaps looked very promising at first is not going anywhere. So this, this again, takes a kind of shift in, in culture. And you also need to operationalize, which is Microsoft speak for use it and put this into production. So again, if you make something and if you, if you have a nice Jupyter notebook, that's not enough. That model that sits in your Jupyter notebook then needs to be used by someone and it needs to be perhaps uh, embedded into bigger systems and into the bigger picture. So if it's not used in production, it never happened. That's the point. And uh, this is incredibly important. And I think many companies are now realizing that this really is the key point. You can talk about data science and you can do data science and you can do cool stuff with data science, but then if it doesn't actually make a difference, if it doesn't actually change anything, then why are you doing it in the first place? So with that, the kind of recipe that I think works is that you need to embed data science, by which I mean the process, the culture, everything we talked to you about up until now. This starts at the top. So um, you know, it needs to, to come uh, from the top of the company. And of course, from the bottom, there needs to be understanding of this. You need to build and rebuild pretty quickly. That's, that's the key. And of course, you need to actually use it. Otherwise, again, it's kind of pointless. So the nice example I have of this that I was referring to previously uh, is that I once built something for a university in Italy that shall remain unnamed. They wanted to uh, build a system to re-rank students uh, according to the, the grades they got in, in different subjects. And they wanted to do it in some smart mathematical way that I will not bore you with. So I built the entire system. And then, of course, there was no adoption because they thought, well, you know, we're just going to do a weighted average, which is what we've always been doing. So, so that, that was a fantastic experience. I learned a lot of, of how to build the actual system and the web interface to it and whatnot. So it was fun for me. Uh, but at the end of the day, it went nowhere. And that's, that's the point. So you want stuff that you make to, to actually be used and, and to make a difference there. So how do you do that? That's the question. And I think the how in this case is education. So we need, you know, th there needs to be some change. In, and this is where I'm now coming back to the teaching component. We've seen what we want. Now, how do you achieve it through changing people because this, these, are, these are all changes that you need to, some of them of course are societal so they take longer, you know, new generations are much different from the previous ones in, in what they understand of data and um, in general I think that you need two components, you need good people and you need good teams and finding them is hard so maybe give you a couple of pointers of what seemed to have worked previously. So if you want to attract and retain good people, uh, I think as a company, you need to have an idea where you're going. I call that the roadmap. And uh, you need to know, you know, data is included in my company strategy in this way. And this is where data makes a difference. If you don't have that, if you, again, are just hiring data scientists because that's what the cool companies do, but you don't actually have anything to, uh, to offer them, that doesn't work. And this, again, goes both ways. If you're a data scientist, this also means that you probably want to ensure that the company you're applying to has some idea of what they want to do with data. Also high for potential. As I said, it's kind of laughable that you get those uh, job ads with 10 years of experience and uh, a data science master's or a machine learning PhD that you might get, actually. Um, but you, know, you can hire for potential, and this is possibly the best way of doing so, rather than checking that people can code or that they have a good you know, understanding of stats rather than asking them, well, what's the difference of using uh, Gini versus Gini as the impurity for you know, a random forest? But it's something you can probably look up in the site and learn documentation 
it's probably much better to give them a simplified version of your business problem in business terms that you understand and see how they approach it. And it's beautiful. We've tried something similar in my previous company. And it's beautiful how uh, people approach problems and you know, sometimes come up with solutions that are perfectly fine and you would not have come up with yourself. So that's, that's quite nice. Also, let them choose their tools, um, as long as it's not Excel. Joke. <laughs> Give them Excel as well if they want it. Uh, but don't necessarily, of course you want, if you have a team, you want people to be using mostly the same stuff because then they can help each other. Uh, but in general, as I said, data science is not about the tools. So if you force people to use certain things, and I know especially um, you know, financial, the financial industry is quite strictly regulated in what they can run on their machines. Uh, and I've bumped into many problems with, with students using their work laptops. You know, it's, it's a good idea to let people explore, use different tools. You might find new stuff. You might find packages that you like. And you need to be kind of free and, and able to, to explore that. Also give them resources. And this is a point we'll talk about uh, in the next couple of slides. By this, I mean, you know, if you need something, if you need a server, if you need version control, if you need a GitHub account, if you need uh, continuous integration, anything that helps in terms of software development, which is, I think, a big part of what data science has become nowadays. It's not just the statistical analysis that Fisher did you know, 100 years ago, uh, and he could do that on paper. A lot of what we do, and especially the link with automation, is, uh, is a link with computer science. So this is something that you need to give people resources for. And also nurture their curiosity, because I think if you are in this business and if you are um, a data scientist or you want to become a data scientist, the number one thing is that you're curious. And this is what differentiates you, and this is you want to find something in data. So if you go into a job and then stagnate, that probably is not great um, as, as an environment. So as I said, there are two, I think, main groups of people. This is an oversimplification. And uh, of course, there are many, you know, the, um, the spectra of um, of people working in data is much larger than this one, but this is the kind of two extremes I see. Uh, on one side, you have the data analysts, which uh, is a kind of more traditional position. They understand the business, they value automation, so they know that you know, many people are actually frustrated by Excel and would like something better, but uh, that, takes, that takes time to, to learn. And to these people, we can teach the pragmatism of the software engineer. And in software, especially after we've been in computer science for a while, you start realizing that most systems that look very polished, I like to think of Apple because it's all nice and smooth. Actually, if you start going inside and looking at the innards, they are, like most innards, not particularly clean and not particularly tidy. So many systems, many real systems, many real world systems are actually a mess. And you realize this and this is something you live with and you as much as possible live with. So that's, that's the idea. For the software engineer, they of course understand the tech. They don't necessarily understand what the, the other guy's trying to do. So they know how to automate things and they don't necessarily know why they're doing it. So they're told of putting stuff uh, in production, doing things, uh, but they don't necessarily understand what the point is of, of doing so. Now, of course, they both don't live in a vacuum and they shouldn't live in a vacuum. And um, I think from the point of view of the upskilling them. We're doing a decent job with data analysts. A lot of my students are actually from um, this left uh, column. So they come from a more data analyst background. They have experience in Excel, again, uh, SQL, that kind of stuff. And what they want to do is maybe learn Python. That seems to be the number one request. Some people prefer R, but that's, that's the idea. And I think we're doing a good job with this. A lot of the online courses teach you a lot of the fundamentals, but what they lack is they don't teach you the part here on the on the right, so they don't teach you what you actually do with it. And I, this is a, a kind of apology if you've been in one of my courses. Um, this is something that we spend a lot of time doing: is modeling, understanding data, and how you automate all of this. But then we don't really teach what to do with it. And this is probably a shortcoming of many of those online courses as well. You know what to do, or you know you know what to do with the data, so you know how to. Uh, to put a model together, maybe you know how to evaluate it, how to evaluate multiple models, how to build the entire thing, but then you don't actually know how that is taken and put into a production system where other people can use it, other people can call it. My, my previous role, 
um, when I was in a kind of trading company. And you know, I built the, the very first model they had. That took me four months. And then I spent the following six months just making sure that that was put into production. And there's a lot of, of thought that goes into that process. There's a lot of considerations that have nothing to do with statistics. They have nothing to do with the performance of the model. But they have a lot to do with in my specific case with the performance of the software and how do you ensure that that actually is fast enough in a trading uh, environment, you know, fast enough meant 10 milliseconds roughly, which was a challenge with, with Python. So it kind of shifted from there, which is the fun bit, if you are a data scientist possibly, to here. And if you're not traditionally trained in computer science, perhaps this is something you don't like. So you want a bit of both. You want a mix of the two. And of course, people are going to come from different domains. And as I said, this is an oversimplification of, of the two. But I think we're doing a good job here, but we're coming short of something on the other side. Of course, you need people. And both of those, um, you know, the, the data analyst and, and the software engineer, they don't live in a vacuum, of course. They, they live normally in teams. and. You need a team that's diverse, so you need a bit of both. Now, a good question could be, well, what's the ratio? What's the ideal ratio? And different companies have different opinions on how many software engineers you should have per data scientist. I've heard anything between one to one to one to four. So um, I think the official Microsoft stance, but don't quote me on that, is two to one. You also need flexibility, though. You cannot be a software engineer in a data science team and just assume you're going to do pure software development, because that doesn't work. But this also goes for the data science. You can't be a data scientist in a data science team and just think that you're going to build models. And perhaps if you're more mathematically inclined, you're going to write equations on a whiteboard. And that's all you're going to be doing. Again, you need to be coding those models and you need to be using them. And of course, you need to collaborate with uh, people as, as you do so. Remember, though, and this is something which is um, quite nice, comes from graph theory, hence the graph that if you have a team of n people, the number of pairwise links and pairwise connections that you can build amongst them is quadratic, is n squared. And you know, it's everyone with everybody else minus themselves. So it's n squared in, in a kind of expansion, which means that you have a lot of complexity there. So if you are the only data scientist, which was my position uh, kind of a year and a half ago, that's quite simple. A team of one doesn't require any communication. Everything is in your brain. So you can just communicate with yourself, and that, that's it. Now, when you go up to two people, this is still fine, because there's you know, a one-to-one -one communication. Effectively, there's a single link between two people, and they can sit down, and they can quite quickly share ideas, decide what to do. Now you get to three people, and suddenly, the number of links starts going up from you know, just one to three. And then you get to four people, and you know, it goes up very, very quickly. So to go back to the uh, original point of what I was saying about teams, you know, the data scientists needing to be a bit of a software engineer, not a proper software engineer, of course, but you know, needing to know about that. And the software engineer needed to know about data science. You need this shared understanding. And this I need is where we need to go and, and what we need to be working on more. And I, I seriously hope that courses, I've, I've seen some change in this already, especially in the online materials. And this is something I'm interested um, in doing more of myself. We need to, in data science courses particularly, teach that little bit of um, software engineering best practices. This, uh, this is stuff that you know, software has been uh, built for a few decades now. So there's a lot of information and there's a lot of uh, lessons learned here as well, and we cannot possibly ignore it since data science really is at the intersection of IT and statistics. So that's, that's the idea. If you take away only three things from today, and then I'm going to stop for some time for questions. The first one is that you should probably embed data science and the process. So by this I mean understand that the returns are very skewed. Many projects will go nowhere. You need to kill them quickly. You need to iterate fast. You need to make sure that there is adoption, so everything I'll be talking about. You also probably need to understand that a company needs to have an idea of what's going to happen with data. This is possibly the most important thing. If you don't know what's going to happen, then what's the point? But also don't look for unicorns. They don't exist, after all. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please.
It's a very good question. So, um, for resources, if you want to get more into software engineering, I don't really believe there is much from the data science point of view. There is a lot in terms of, you know, you want to learn software engineering, and uh, you can find many learn uh, or teach yourself computer science. Uh, links on, on GitHub. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there is much in terms of how do you actually apply this in the data science domain. So this is, the, the short answer is unfortunately not. Um, but I believe that more will come out in, in, this, uh, in this field very soon. So watch this space. <laughs> Hmm, good question. So, the I guess if I were to, re to rephrase this, this is something like, can you teach intuition in data science? And I think you might be able to. I think a lot of this come, a lot of the intuition and a lot of what you know, knowing what you're looking for comes from uh, doing it and repeating it. And you know, uh, this is perhaps something else I should have included. That's something that we don't normally teach. You teach a lot of tech, in, in a sense, a lot of coding, a lot of models, uh, but you don't, or it's perhaps difficult or almost impossible to communicate how do you actually go about finding um, good projects. So I try in the sense that, um, especially for, for projects that people do in their own time, you can guide them and this is more of a mentoring, perhaps, relationship. Um, so there's definitely some aspect of this, but it's, it's very hard, yes. Do you have any other questions? Yes, um, got two more. Let's say you're within a data science team, but the problem statement from the management is quite vague. Mm -hmm. well, so how do you deal with this? Ah, so that's, that's another very good question, yes. So um, the, it, I think it will always be the case that you get vague statements, and, and possibly the, the vaguest one is, well, we want to increase profit. It's like any business wants to do that, we believe. Uh, this is normal. A lot of data science is, in fact, uh, people-oriented almost, and there's a, a kind of internal consulting team, if you wish, um, dynamic there. We're trying to understand or making people understand the problem in terms of data and you being able to understand the problem in their terms, whatever they are. So this is the, the communication aspect, and it is crucially important, you're right. You cannot um, go about data science without you know, being able to translate what you're doing into your terms, your statistical terms, and then back to where they came from in, in words they can understand. I think you had one final question, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I was fearing this question. <laughs> it was one of the slides. I, I, it's, it's a very good question. Is it easy to teach uh, software engineers data science or is it easy to teach data scientists software engineering? I don't know. Um, I've had a lot of experience teaching so data science to software engineers. Okay. Um, uh, and they goodbye. pick up Python like nothing, but then they don't really see the point of what's being done. Uh, I've so done the opposite as well. Okay. And, uh, People seem, well, it, it, coding can get quite frustrating if you've not done it before. Even if you've done it for many years, thanks to my mother, I've been doing it for 24 years now. And um, it, it's still frustrating, and you still end up using Stack Overflow every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sure it's a shared experience. So the, an the short answer is I don't really know. I believe both um, can be taught the other, and, and they both need to know a little bit about nature. I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much. We Mark. have indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John Luca.